Hi, I'm Dr. Travis McCoy. I am a reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist in Jacksonville, Florida. I have today a lady who has a very large uterine fibroid. She's 47 years old, a Gravita 1, Para 1. Uh, she would like to retain her uterus um, for the possibility of future fertility, uh, though she knows that is very unlikely, but she's just not ready to give up her uterus. Her history is also complicated by her having severe menorrhagia and anemia. Um, when I, she first contacted me, her hemoglobin was six, and she also is a Jehovah's Witness and would not accept blood transfusions. So in order to have surgery, um, I actually used, uh, we used a lot of iron therapy and a birth control pill to get her blood count up. It's now up to 14 in only about five months' time. Um, her insurance would not approve Lupron, and she could not afford that to help get her blood count up, but she's actually done very well by taking a lot of iron supplements. Her uterus is very large. We'll show you on the MRI in just a minute, but it's, um, the, it comes to about 22 weeks size gestational age, and she has a 14 by 14 by 10 centimeter single uterine fibroid. I laid out here my landmarks. This is where her uterus is palpating out to. She's a, a little overweight, and so there's a little bit of a margin, but it comes to about 20 to 22 weeks size. These, this is her costal margin I've marked out here. So I really have enough room, uh, which is the main thing to addressing these robotically, is do I have enough room to get in with my camera? As long as I have enough room to get my camera in, and sometimes I have to put a sub xiphoid camera um, as long as I have enough room that I can see around, size usually isn't a limit, limitation. This woman is quite short too, she's only five foot one, but luckily she has enough room here. So um, oftentimes I least like to have a minimum of maybe eight centimeters or so from where it palpates. Sometimes when I get my ports in, I can actually push the uterus away from me a little bit while I work. And so I have more than enough room here. Um, with her being uh, uterus being this large, I'm going to start with actually a left upper quadrant entry. Normally I go in the midline, but uh, I don't like to do a varies needle this high up the aorta and, and vena cava is so close. So I'm going to go ahead and plot my port locations. When one is this high, it's important to keep your ports very high, and I will really keep my ports almost all the way to the costal margins on this aspect, because I need to get them really as high as they can. So I'm going to have my midline camera up here my uh, second arm about right here, and my third arm will be very lateral, just coming in just over the descending colon. Since her cavity is so large, this is a 12 French Foley catheter to put in it. I often use the clear view uterine manipulator, which is very nice, not to manipulate from the bottom just for chromatubation, but uh, her cervix is very elongated and this would not stay, this wouldn't even get to her uterine cavity. So in these cases, I'm going to use a, a very long 12 French Foley and I use a adapter that's a catheter adapter. In order to get it to stay tight, I have to cut a little bit of this off and then it'll wedge in there very nicely. Uh, for chromatubation, I use indigo carmine uh, dye. I use two ampules in 100 cc's. I want it to be very, very dark. Um, that way, so it, it really stains the uterine cavity and really marks it well. You'll go ahead and flush that for me. Okay. She has an orogastric tube in to decompress the stomach. Ready for the gas, Priscilla? Go ahead with high. Okay. I'm going to go in with a five um, visual trocar. I'll also do this with the uh, people who have had prior surgeries. And then once I get my main ports in, I'll exchange it for an eight robotic port. Okay. Log in here. So 
they don't have a manipulator in to push her uterus up. So actually, you count for the obesity, it's, it's coming just about to the level of the umbilicus. That gives me more than enough room to put my midline port in. The only time I've had trouble when I, when I have these this high is if you have a far deep posterior or anterior fibroid, you can run into some trouble reaching it from this high. Um, our gas over. For this lateral arm, I do like it to be very lateral so that I can miss uh, the arms. Um, it's much easier on a woman like this that's a little bit overweight, you have a little more room. It's much more difficult on a woman who's very, very small. Now that she's inflated, her ribs are up a little bit higher, so I have more than enough room over here. And that's the biggest limitation to uh, a myomectomy is just this, the size and when you run out of room. Um, that's the only real limitation I've, I've had. Then I'm going to place a 10 millimeter assistant port, especially when we're passing a lot of sutures. Um, that makes it a lot easier. If I'm doing a simple case where I only need one suture, such as you know, an occasional hysterectomy or a simple small fibroid that was removed, we'll sometimes pass it down the camera port. But when I know that I have such a big fibroid, it's going to take multiple sutures, a 10 millimeter is really essential. So initially I have, I'm going to take down these adhesions very quickly. It's probably just from her prior C-section, which was 14 years ago, her boy is 14 now. Looks like she's got a little bit of an abdominal hernia here as well. And the uterus is definitely stuck up a little bit.
definitely a bit of a hernia. The adhesions like this are not uncommon. This is a little more than most C-sections. I mainly see this if I'm doing a second myomectomy. I often get a lot of patients who've had prior open myomectomies and they can open myomectomies. That's part of the reason I don't like to do them anymore is that they can cause a tremendous amount of adhesion, sometimes involving the bowel. So that can definitely complicate things in that setting. And of course, C-sections are really variable in what you find and come back and get that. See if I can get this omentum freed off of the uterus first. It appears to just be attached all around. is really just adhere to the cirrhosis. I'm trying to not get into the cirrhosis too much or I could definitely have some bleeding issues. This woman, um, since she is Jehovah's Witness and will not accept blood transfusions, we are set up to use a cell saver today. Um, she, her blood count is actually very good, but you know, the cell saver is one of those things you don't, I don't know what kind of bleeding I'm going to get into and at a hemoglobin of 14, that's wonderful. I'm sure I will not have any trouble, but it's not something that we can get set up very on a quick notice. Uh, we have to have an outside perfusionist come in. So, so I opted to go ahead and have the cell saver here just in case we needed it. Um, I know that different beliefs, there are different beliefs around. Uh, she had okay to cell saver with her, um, with her pastors. I try to check this omentum before I let it go because after you lose it, you can definitely have some bleeding and it'll usually stop, but it can very, it's very hard to find the bleeding point later. I've definitely got an area bleeding up here. I need to get addressed once I get this off. Yeah, I have a little bit of bleeding here. Could you irrigate that for me a little bit, Miriam? Okay. That looks pretty good. I like to make sure it's hemostatic before I put it down. So this is just giving a survey here of the uterus, um, the cecum, appendix here, ovary here. Definitely see some vascularity around the under the tube there. Coming over to the left, fallopian tube and ovary. So what I'm going to work on first, I think, is just freeing up a little bit the uh, abdominal adhesions just to give myself a little more motility. Prior to nucleating a fibroid and then have that open and then have limited mobility. I find that when you have difficult adhesions like this in the midline for C-sections, you know, start back where it's normal 
and then dissect to the to the frozen area. And once you work on an area and you run out of space and you can't figure out where the it's going, kind of backtrack and go somewhere else. This is coming free pretty easily. behind this lesion so I can figure out what's what. I'm actually using the cut here just to make it a little cleaner cut. Trying not to leave too big of a defect in the fascia, but not trying to tear up the uterus as well. There, that's coming down very nicely. It's kind of in the anterior bladder flap area. Just go ahead and roll this down a little bit just to get maximum uterine uh, mobility. see the obliterated umbilical arteries here. Okay. It's probably enough for now. Okay. So, yeah, very large floppy uterus, um, the aortic bifurcation here, so you can see how high we are up. It's another little small fibroid I noted on the MRI. So let's take a look at the MRI and see what we're dealing with here. Um, and I have this set up on a dual monitor system, and so I'm actually looking at her in a sagittal plane. Um, you can see her uterus here, there's the bladder, the spine. Her umbilicus is right here. So this was coming, to, this is her lying flat to about 22 week size. Um, this is measuring 14 by 10 centimeters. And at the same view here, it was about 10 centimeters, I'm sorry, 13 centimeters wide. And here what we can see is this is primarily, this is posterior and to the left. The bright stripe is the endometrial cavity going around the far right side. So from her cervix here, the cavity goes all the way up and around. So this is posterior and left. And that's very important for me to see because looking at it, um, I can't really tell that it's on the left side at all. There's one four centimeter fibroid right here on the anterior and a couple small fibroids that are in the two centimeter range right here. So I have the MRI right beside me by my console. That way I can just turn and scroll through it. And that way I can locate every fibroid. I think that's key in doing a myomectomy, especially in a young person, to make sure you get every fibroid. The other thing I'm looking at here is this is her myometrium. I would like to approach it over the thinnest portion of the myometrium, which maybe appears to be very, very posterior. And on this side, because the cavity comes all the way around, the thinnest portion is probably be on the far left. And if I get up here, if I cut over the top of this cavity um, and start incising on the top, I'm probably going to open the cavity, and I don't want to do that. So looking here, I have one superficial fibroid here. I know there was another one over here. That's probably it. It looked a little bigger than that. 
and this is the one that's about four centimeters, I believe. That's probably it right there. So I will get that last. Is her blood pressure okay? So, still high? Okay. Usually I, I inject vasopressin in these cases, but uh, this patient in particular is having some difficulties with her blood pressure. And so I'm going to forego the, the vasopressin solution um, just to not exacerbate her hypertension. So you can see the left tube here, and that's one thing I, that I'm looking for to get my bearings. Here's my left fallopian tube entrance, and my right tube is right here. So the uterus is not really rotated. Sometimes it'll be rotated quite a lot. So here's the mid plane of the uterus. This fibroid, like I said, it looks very posterior, but it's very posterior and left. So I'm probably going to try to, to make an incision somewhere in this range. This one is so deep, I'm going to have to have a long vertical incision. And I'm probably going to encounter some fairly significant bleeding. We're using the cell saver, and so I'm going to have her just try to stay with me so that we can process it as much as we can. And probably I'm going to come right down here, and so I'll take that one out while I'm at it. I use a, uh, I use a cut fashion to come across the serosa. Um, usually on a pure cut in a very fast motion, leaves very little thermal spread on the serosa. And it lets me open it up very fairly quickly. using one of my other instruments to spread a little bit. Basically, it's, it's a little slow till I get down to the level of the fibroid. Once I grab the fibroid, once I'm able to grasp the, the fibroid and lift upwards on it, it will start to really uh, compress these small, these small blood vessels. And you can get a lot better hemostasis. So initially, I will just start until I get to I'm getting a lot of smoke here. Brian, can you turn my electric up to 50, please? I'm going to turn my wattage up just a little bit, but I want to get in to where I can grasp the fibroid. So now I'm trying to grasp the fibroid and really elevate it a little bit. Yeah, definitely have to get into some blood loss to begin with before you can get the fibroid elevated enough that you can see. So now once I get a hold of the fibroid, then I'll maybe see if I can gain a little bit of ground with coagulation. Though sometimes you can have such large blood vessels, they're very hard to control. There have been times that I have such bleeding going in that I actually have to run like a whip stitch down the edge in order to uh, to get the bleeding under control. So I'm getting to the fibroid down here, but I mean this I'm basically in the middle of, a, of an enormous vein. And so it's very, you can have a lot of bleeding until you get down to the fibroid. Once you can actually grasp it and lift up on it, it can then help to compress, to compress it. I'm still into a lot of vessels here kind of going through the capsule of the of the fibroid so I'm not to the fibroid yet so I, I'm, I've gotten into a lot of large veins which is not uncommon I would have liked to have used patrestin in this lady but I feel it's not it wasn't quite safe so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to throw some stitches in this to try to get some hemostasis And you just have to have your team uh, ready to have all this ready and to work with this because you can get into some significant bleeding. And these sutures, I will usually take these out later. Um, I'm simply just trying to get some hemostasis. You can see what kind of big veins I have.
One thing about the V-lock, I can put this in and then pull it out later very easily. Okay, I'm going to let you uh, take this one. I have another suture ready, though, just in case. And I want to take this, the uh, scissor back. So now I'm basically, since I've got this area um, kind of under control hemostatically, I'm not going to expand it right now. I'm going to try to dig down until I can find the fibroid and find the right plane I want to be in. Um, I've put a running uh, 2-0 V-lock suture down this edge. I had some very large venous bleeding there. Um, the patient is hypertensive in the case, so I've not used vasopressin, and her hypertension doesn't help the, the amount of bleeding either. This fibroid on palpation is very soft, and so, and it really not surprisingly, because it's probably been here a very, very long time, and so sometimes it's hard to know exactly. Uh, this could very well be the fibroid. So first thing I'm going to do is use my cut and go down and just open it up and try to see if I can find a, a delineation plane um, to find out what is and is not fibroid. This looks. This looks very fibroidy to me. This looks like an old dead fibroid. I probably have it grabbed in my sutures here. Um, so I think that's where I'm at. In some cases that's good and bad. Um, it's somewhat good because it's easier to pull and um, though sometimes it makes it you wish there were a sharper margin um, to separate the, it from normal myometrium. If you had something to really grab onto it would separate more clearly. Yeah, but I think I'm getting in the plane here. It seems like it's developing. I might have, very well obviously have bleeding on the opposite side. Um, since the same veins were cut. Okay, so at least I know I'm in the right plane now. So what I'm probably going to do is extend this incision down. And just, of course, be prepared for more bleeding. Usually I will only extend these as much as I can really manage and keep control of um, at a time. And as you can see this is surrounded by very, very large veins. That definitely looks like the right plane here. I'm kind of pulling and pushing to kind of milk it out. What I'll do if I can get this separated, then I'll probably suture all this again. Sometimes if you find an identifiable place, you can use electrocautery, but some of these veins are just too big for that. But lucky we were able to get this lady's hemoglobin up to a level of 14 it was this morning, and, uh, and then having the cell saver, I'm sure we'll be able to use it. And so I'm just doing blunt dissection. Really, with a, a large fibroid, remember, if you're in bleeding, you're in the wrong plane. Um, now, I know I've cut through all this plane, so I'm trying to see what is and isn't fibroid here. It's very easy to make a false passageway, a false uh, gap down within the myometrium. And so sometimes you'll start dissecting out, and if it just gets too bloody, you have to reconsider. Um, you know, something is not right if you're having a lot of bleeding when you're doing the dissection. Because I definitely seem to have a plane here. And so 
you know, I'll, if I can't find a plane, I'll go back to where I, it seems like I do have a plane and follow it around. And like I said, a soft fibroid does help to separate out, but it also tears very easy. And I would rather, I would rather have a, a nice solid fibroid. I thought this one was going to be calcified and somewhat look like on the MRI, but perhaps not. Yep, and here you can see, I think I'm getting into the right plane um, here. It's separating out very cleanly. Definitely having more luck uh, getting around the front side of this than the back side. Again, here's my tube coming in this way. So I want to, don't want to try to take my incision this much more this way anteriorly, though I may have to. Uh, we'll just see. You know, my assistant's helping me trying to get most of the blood out, you know, even so I can both see where my plane is and we can save more of this for the cell saver. The farther I get here, the more thankful I am I made that decision. Once I can get a good plane established all the way around here, then I, I can come around and throw a stitch all the way around the uh, border edge to, uh, for hemostasis. But I really want to have my, my well-defined edges first. Before I do that, I'm getting there. You can see I'm getting in a big vein there, so I'm too shallow. That means the fibroid is farther on this side. Yeah, you can see it. But often when I have bleeding, if you can just grab the fibroid and lift it up, it'll compress the, 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 it'll compress the venous bleeders. Then you can look at it, figure out where you're at, and make a plan. So that upward traction is another reason to have your ports very high. Often if you put it where you think you're, you've got just enough room to get in, um, you don't allow enough for stretching the uterus upwards and putting it on traction. So I'm definitely starting to have a clear plane develop here. There we go. So I'm almost at a point where I can maybe get a stitch around some of this to get some hemostasis. Come out of there just a minute, Mary. Let me see what you're dealing with there. Yeah, I've got a big vein. I want to give myself a little more room down here so I can get that vein. It's the other problem with a soft fibroid is the veins will hug. You can see the veins there. They'll hug very close to it and will kind of almost go more inwardly, whereas, you know, with a, a rigid fibroid, you have a
clear delineation of location. But the surprising thing with a soft one is like this. I very well might be able to take out this whole fibroid through this little, small little uterine incision. Um, because it'll just give and give and give and you can basically turn the uterus inside out. Um, it, makes, it, it makes you have to be very creative on how to close it because then you're dealing with a very, very deep hole. Um, but sometimes you can really do that and limit um, how big your incision is, which is probably going to help you you know, overall, I've got to get behind these vessels here before I can feel safe of cutting them, of getting them tied off. Basically, when you're not making progress on one area or having trouble or getting frustrated, you just move to another area and just start over fresh. Um, and over here, it's a new world. As long as I'm not hemorrhaging too bad over there, I'll leave it for now. Um, I'd be a little more worried if I didn't have the self-saver and if her hemoglobin wasn't as high as it is. But it's okay, I can live with this. She can too. So now it looks like here I might be getting away from the fibroid. I just, I'm seeing some fibers. So I'm going to actually cut back into the fibroid. And if you think you're getting into the plane, bad plane, especially when you're getting around the back of a fibroid, um, I would just stop and cut back into the fibroid. So you, really around the back is when you'll get in the wrong plane. Instead of dissecting around the fibroid, you'll dissect away from the fibroid and get into some bleeding. And that bleeding also is always in a part that's the deepest hole and is the hardest to address. So, I all, that's the main key and one of the biggest keys is following the fibroid. This is, seems to be peeling okay there. Got to get some of this bleeding stopped. That's a vein. And these are massive veins. Some of these veins are a centimeter and a half, two centimeters wide. And um, so that's. As soon as I can get this isolated a little better over here, and I might not be in the right plane, I'm just trying to clean this up. My thought is to uh, be able to get a suture in it. And get that under control and then continue. Okay, let me go, go ahead and pop, and pop the needle drivers in again. We obviously haven't sucked up all the blood, but we've only got about a hundred in the machine, so um, maybe a, a couple hundred blood loss. It always looks much more.
and I'm just not trying to make this pretty, just trying to get some a little bit more hemostasis. just working it around and just trying to see what it's going to give me basically to try to try to figure out the next steps so you can see that fibroid just really tears as well when I grab it Just keep slow and steady pressure. You can usually make ground. <clears throat> the uterus will try to expel it. Go ahead and put the scissor back in. I'm going, unfortunately I'm going to have to expand this incision one way or the other. Um, so I'm going to see what, it's a question of which way will give me the most access and which way will have less bleeding. I think I'm going to have to do it this way. Um, I just don't have much of a choice to get, oh, my monopolar please. Getting a lot of fogging just because we're making a lot of smoke here and it means we're having to move a lot of gas. It's starting to really work out. That's making a that's making a big difference there. And if I'm not sure of the right plane, I'll cut back on it. This is so soft, though. It's uh, very difficult to find the real plane. So it's probably where. It's one of the reasons as it's tearing out, it's it's partially tearing out some myometrium. It's another reason why we're getting into so much bleeding issues. It's clearly fibroid there though. There. You can see that it's really pulling out really easy. Maybe starting to get around this now.
And often in cases if you have smaller fibroids and you have just a lot of bleeding, sometimes what the, you know, it's hard to get the blood controlled at the time. You have to try to make sure, you know, that of course your patient is stable enough to tolerate that kind of blood loss, but then you just have to get the fibroid out and get it closed. Um, and there's no other simple procedure or key to that, um, you know, and as I think in, like in this case, as long as I feel like I'm making progress, it looks like I'm getting things done. Um, blood loss is something that's, you know, if it seems like it's still within reason and, and she's not getting into a bad situation here, then, um, you know, I will continue this on. I'm getting around most of it to be able to, I'm just a lot of pushing and pulling and tugging because it's hard to see the plane, um, so I'm letting it show me the plane. the back side of it here now. Um, now I very well might get out of the other plane, but as soon as I roll this out, then I'll be able to attack it and, um, and really get, start to get the bleeding under control. My monopolar. Felt like there I was maybe in the wrong, yeah. Felt like I was definitely in the wrong plane, so I'm trying to cut back onto the fibroid to find the right plane. Often, when I have a big fibroid like this, I'll take my scissor, kind of dig it in to hold it to reposition my tenaculum. I don't usually like to force fibroids out. I like to usually know exactly where my planes are, but I'm kind of getting into, with this being this soft, it doesn't leave you much choice because you can't really see the plane difference between them. So I'm merely trying to get in and bluntly dissect this around. And it is coming, it's, I mean, it's continuing to make progress. And just to get a backup view, you can see it really starting to starting to come out. The fibroids can definitely have different consistencies. They can behave differently as they get older. Um, this, this, fibroid, this fibroid is very, very soft. Oftentimes they can be firm and calcify. This, this one has probably been there a very long time.
and that's probably why most often when I see them that are starting to become necrotic and dead, they will soften up and somewhat collapse. And you think that would be a good thing, but I would always rather have one be very firm. When it's firm, it allows me to be able to grab it, pull it up, and it, it'll, it'll quickly compress all of those uh, blood vessels. But with this, it just gives. And so I'm having, it's definitely why I'm having significantly more bleeding. You can. What I'm starting to see, I'm about ready to roll this out. I'm starting to see, I see a hint of blue here that's coming from the dye, so I'm right on the endometrial cavity. Again, this is turned inside out. And so now I'm rolling this off the side. So just about got this out. Rolling this off the side where the endometrial cavity is. I want to be very careful not to tear it. Again, when I get to the round the back side, usually to find the proper plane, it's a matter of cutting back into the fibroid to ensure you're in the right plane. Cut and push a little bit, cut and push a little bit. And this is just about out. I believe, as long as there's not a second. Sometimes you get it as out and you think you're out and there's a second lobe of it that is not there. And I'll have to see this in a minute to figure out which it might be. Looks like that's probably a maybe a second lobe of it. Go ahead and push some blue dye. So that I uh, might have opened a cavity here. Somewhat that just keep pushing a lot. You have to maybe not. Maybe it's just a plane. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I thought maybe that could have been the cavity, but it was not. So what I had this was just a simple loop in of one fibroid and then coming out to the other kind of tail of it. So I thought I was getting around it, but it still looked like there was a lot of room there. And I did not think I had 14 centimeters of fibroid outside of her already. So finally, at least getting some little bit better planes. And when it comes to major blood loss, um, people, um, you know, have tried other things, some techniques. People have tried are tourniquets, and I use tourniquets when I would do procedures open. Tourniquets are very hard to place laparoscopically. I've never found one that was really satisfactory to me. I um, have clamped off sometimes the uterine arteries, the, the, the vessels, using uh, laparoscopic vascular bulldog clamps. Um, I have a set of those. However, Oftentimes, you have to, you, you know, you got to do the dissection down into the pelvic sidewall to get to the uterine arteries. And often, in the cases you need it in, the uterus is very big. It's very difficult to get visualization and becomes risky. You, you do 
are more likely to probably injure a ureter uh, doing that as well. I have done it before. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times I think the help is not as much as you, as you would think, often because these can pull a lot of blood um, out of the vagina, um, out of the vaginal arteries. And so a lot of times I have clamped off the uterine arteries, actually at you know the hypogastric, clamp off the infundibular pelvic arteries to clamp off the ovaries temporarily and they can still bleed a tremendous amount um, and, and, uh, and that's usually coming from the vaginal branches. So um, that's a risky procedure uh, because you are more apt to damage a ureter um, and sometimes it can help uh, but often the people you need it in are the ones that it's most difficult to place it in. So that's why typically my favorite best aspect is speed. Um, here is fibroid. Can you clean that camera for me now? Okay, so now we've cleaned the camera. Um, I have this out and I'm going to try to put it back here. You can see it's yeah, quite, quite large. Um, but I think that's all of it. So I'm going to put that in the upper abdomen there. And actually, you know, you see I was getting into some really major bleeding. And then oftentimes once you get it out, the veins have a time to contract. Um, you know, I, it's bleeding, but not as bad as, as one would have initially thought. And I actually see the posterior cul-de-sac now. So now we have that out. So now we can actually, actually see the pelvis now. Um, bleeding has stopped significantly just simply by doing nothing. Part of it too is the more bleeding you have, you're sucking, you're dropping your pneuma peritoneum down and you're losing pressure and the more pressure you lose, um, the more bleeding you're going to have. Um, so what I'm kind of going to do at this point is see if, if there's any residual pieces that I left behind. Um, maybe this is a little piece. It's very hard to tell. Um, Sometimes when it's real clean, you can just tell. The, the fibroids tend, again, use, I'm using my eyes as my feel. Fibroids, to tell the difference between them, these little pieces. The main thing is because it's hard to tell is I try not to leave these in the first place. Um, I try to get them out clean to begin with. And then, um, but they are a little rubbier, rubberier, a little more rubbery. Um, often they're a little wider. Um, whereas the, my, the myometrium is a little more pink and so but it's, it's often just the one part doesn't look like the other So now when I'm, so I think this looks pretty good. What I'll do, I'm gonna look back. I'll kind of go through it in any obvious bleeders, particularly arterial bleeders, I'll try to get. The venous, I'm gonna get on my closing. Um, this, um, this actually does not look too bad. I know I was getting into some big vessels on this sidewall. So what I've got, I've got a deep, hole over here, you know, into this pelvic sidewall. I think I will pick that up with suture. And there's right there is a little gusher. So mainly I only try to get the real obvious ones with electric cautery and pick up the rest. This looks like my cavity here. So in closing a, a large defect like this, um, it, 
this one's particularly deep. So I will basically find the base. Um, it takes a little bit of manipulation to get all the way down to the base. So I find the portion that is the farthest away from me. Find the deepest, deepest base of this hole. And that's where I will start my stitch. And I keep digging and digging and digging until I know I'm at the bottom because I don't want to leave any dead spots down here and particularly dead spots that are bleeding. So I, uh, my instruments here, I've, I, I use a mega suture cut in my right hand and a large in my left. Uh, the mega suture cut definitely gives the strength for driving a needle. I like the large because it still allows me to handle the tissue a little bit better. My suture that I'm closing with, these are uh, 2 V-Lock sutures. Um, these are V-Lock 90s. Um, there's a 90 and a 180. This is a little bit faster absorbing. Um, I prefer these as the uterus contracts down very quickly over the next few weeks. Um, I, I don't need the suture to be there several months. And um, you can see this suture on ultrasound as bright echogenic uh, dots for normally about a month to six weeks, whereas when I, I used to use the 180 suture that lasts there much longer, I could see it, I saw it four to five months out, it was still there, and I just didn't need it there. These are 12 inch lengths, which I find are good lengths to, length to uh, run sutures with. I usually use two needle sizes, either a, the GS21, which is this, um, it's a larger needle, it's equivalent to around a CT, between a CT2 and a CT1 needle. Um, and there is another one, it's a GS22, it's a little smaller. I will use it for smaller incisions. Uh, but for big incisions like, like this, where I need to cover a lot of ground a lot faster, especially if I've got bleeding issues, um, I'll use the larger needle. So I'm going to try to find down into the base of this. And I'll basically just walk myself down and I'll have my assistant irrigate a little bit as we get down. You can see some open vessels there. And I think that's close, pretty close to the base of it. I don't think there's anything any farther than there. So I know my cavity here is to the left, I'm sorry, to my right. And so I'm going to take a, a bite here to lock the suture with to begin with. The V-Lock suture on the first bite, it's the first bite does not grab really hemostatic, so I will usually take my second bite through right where I put the first one to really lock it down. Um, using the V-Lock has really revolutionized and saved a lot of time with uh, laparoscopic myomectomies. I used to do them uh, before this was out with Vicryl, and Vicryl just took so much time. You were much more apt to break suture We'll take another bite behind here. And my goal in closing is both to, is to eliminate the dead space, obtain my hemostasis, and reapproximate my tissue to where it should go. And that's one of the, sometimes the hardest things. Now this, if I let go of this, it's going to show me where it's going to go. So it's, this, is, I, this part is actually quite easy. It's another reason why, you know, trying to take the fibroid out of the smallest incision that I possibly can um, is better. And as I take this up, I'll kind of tuck it down a little bit. But when I have a deep hole, I'll start at the bottom and I will just work my way around, often in a spiral fashion and sp spiral my way out. When I run out of suture, um, I'll start another one right there where I was and just continue out. So this is going to be released to push back down in there. You have to use a little imagination to figure out what goes where in this and where it should. The spiraling out technique, I don't always use it, but when I have a very deep hole like this, I will. It's just much better. Uh, going back and forth, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, sometimes I'll go back and forth. I'll change techniques several times, sometimes throughout the closure, just as uh, when I get to one spot. Uh, but sometimes spiraling works here. I've actually, I had an intention of starting spiral, but it 
look like it was uh, now flat coming together. So I might just go back and forth and back and forth. So I basically just really play it by ear, whatever it's going to take to reapproximate it. So yeah, sometimes spiraling out, sometimes just going back and forth rows. Um, it's the one thing about the we're having the V lock. You can start and stop it, and I can go from here to over here and not have to really retie it. And uh, so it's very very convenient in that aspect. And I, these up here, I end up pulling these back out. They've already done their job. So what I'll often do is try to push things back down, see where. Um, see where they're, they will go to. Cut that off. Try to see what naturally goes from one place to the other. And often when you have a big area, you know, you might need to grab several bites. Grab a bite of tissue here, a bite of tissue there to bring it all together. So I'm like this, it's wanting to evert, but I don't think it should. So I'm going to tuck it in just a little bit. You know, this is going to contract down. Remember, this is going to contract down considerably just in the next few days. And so, you know, I'm just rough estimating where things should go. I'm trying to put edges to edges and not create any real false anatomic relationships. But it's going to contract down on its own. And so not only do I want it to come together anatomically right, I don't want my sutures to hold it apart from where it's going to come together anatomically correct. And what you're seeing is that this defect looks already much, much smaller than what the fibroid was. And what you're seeing is that the uterus is already contracting down. The uterus is contracting, is uh, tightening down very well. Um, and that helps you out as you go. And that's why you end up with a uh, much smaller defect. And it oftentimes is your friend as during the case um, as you go because it will tighten down more and more. I see this is going to want to tuck in, so I'm going to take bites over here. And you really have to do one side and then come over and do the other. That way it, it all will roll in and imbricate in and not stay out. I'll need another stitch in just a second. And of course, this case was very nerve-wracking with the large amount of bleeding that I had. But just, you know, sticking with it, I've had a lot of cases like this before. And, and once you get around a breaking point, then it becomes not bad at all. So um, it does take some nerves to get over that first step and put up with that amount of bleeding and not panic. Remember, this was an oblique incision. Well, I just pulled, okay, now I'm ready for my other one. So this was an oblique incision, so this will come over. I'll take this little one out when I get all the way down. So I'm going to actually just start this here. Well, one of the reasons 
um, this lady approached me. Um, was it? And she, this lady actually traveled from the other side of the country. I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. She traveled from Las Vegas. Um, okay, flew in yesterday. Uh, because her, you know, her gynecologist knew of her situation. It was a difficult situation. It. Um, she was severely anemic. Um, she was Jehovah's Witness. He um, had offered her a hysterectomy, and it just wasn't her ideal. She knows that there's very little chance of her conceiving naturally, uh, but she did not want to lose her uterus. Um, she told me today that her mother and all of her sisters had had hysterectomies for fibroids, and she was just adamant that she was going to stop that trend. And um, so she actually found me, and we did phone, multiple phone consults, got her in shape for surgery, but the big thing was her was, uh, you know, doing it minimally invasive. Uh, she had, was able to find a gynecologist who agreed to do an open myomectomy, but, you know, that has a significant morbidity with it. On average, when I tell my patients the difference between open and laparoscopic routes, and I used to do a lot of open myomectomies, approximately two to three days in the hospital, and to go back to work, really, if you could be back to work by mm, six weeks, you know, you're pretty tough. And uh, using a laparoscopic myomectomy route using robotics, it's, it's night and day difference. Um, almost all of my patients go home the same day. Um, actually, of morning cases, I've never had a patient stay overnight. Um, and so I, ha I get 95% of them to go home. The only ones that stay are usually due to nausea issues. We are aggressive in trying to control post-op nausea. If I have a patient who has been, had, had, has had nausea with anesthesia before, I, I use a scopolamine patch uh, the, starting the night before. Um, I try to stay aggressive on hydrating them. I've stopped bow prepping them. Uh, I think that contributes significantly to post-op nausea, and I've had significantly less since I've had them to, do, to stop doing bow preps. I really think it gives no benefit for a myomectomy. Um, but these patients, I, um, I then let them go home, you know, from PACU and, um, often just a couple hours later and, um, they do very well on average, um, narcotic use is a day and a half. And I do have them use a 800 milligram ibuprofen for the first week and narcotics just as they need. And, um, they, they do ex extremely well. Um, most of them can get ba are back to work in about a week, 10 days, and um, they can return to sexual activity, usually in about two weeks. Most of the time, uh, they're a little tender until um, about 10 days to two weeks. And, uh, you know, they're up walking around um, in a few days later and pretty normal, other than just having really some sore abs from their incisions. But otherwise, um, you know, they're, they're doing really well. And so it's really made a huge difference. And I have found that there are not a lot of contraindications to it. Um, size has not been thus far been a limitation as this one um, has shown. You know, I've, I've had upwards even, I had more room in, uh, in her uterus here. And so I've had upwards of, can do 26, 28 week size um, uteruses. And um, they can, do very well. The main uh, consideration is number of fibroids. Um, I don't really have a limit. I don't have an upper limit. I mean, I try to use common sense and talk to the patient about it. Um, I've taken out upwards of 30 um, a couple times. And uh, I'm very commonly in the double digits, unless it's like this with a single large one, and above 20 frequently as well. And I talk to the patient about, you know, what are their goals in trying to decide if a laparoscopic route is, is right for them.
you know, in the last year and the last hundred and last year and a half or so, the last 150 fibroids I've done, I've opened four, and each of those had uh, very large numbers. Three of them had um, around 35 fibroids taken out, and one had severe leiomyomatosis, where I she had a I took out 145 small ones, and uh, but you know otherwise in my practice I've been able to keep 97 percent of them laparoscopic, which you know, cases like this are not easy. Um, they take a lot of time, they take a lot of devotion, but they're the right thing for the patient to do. You know, with her decision, I was able to save her a big incision, huge recovery. Um, you know, yes, I, I've kind of had a fair amount of blood loss this, but you can almost be, re you can almost rest assured she would probably have had as much or more blood loss um, in an open technique. Um, typically, I see blood loss being about a fifth of what an open technique is. Um, some cases like this, we're going to have a significant amount. Luckily, we've got the cell saver, we'll probably be able to hopefully give her back maybe 50% or so of uh, the blood. Now as I'm closing this again, so what I'm now trying to do is reapproximate my edges. My edges, um, the heavy bite here and here. So what I'm actually doing is a little bit, I don't do a straight vertical, it's hard to get that to come together. So in certain cases um, I will usually run a horizontal mattress suture. She's having a little more bleeding. I want to make sure I'm hemostatic. So I'm actually going to do it kind of obliquely. Um, you saw I came in high and went down low and I'm going to kind of come in low. This incision does have a couple you know awkward hand holds but I'm coming out kind of obliquely kind of a running a running vertical stitch to hopefully get some more of these blood vessels and as I do this I will tuck it in a little bit. I often get asked how many layers do you close it in um, and the real simple answer is as many as it takes. Um, it really every uterus closes differently. My goal is to bring you know, the edges together, approximate them well, um, have them be hemostatic. Um, yes, let me have the scissor back real quick.
Sometimes if they're too big, what I'll often do is hold it against the uterus and I will uh, simply butterfly it. Take it on a cut. And I like to get the small ones out. Of course, if you don't hold this to the uterus, you won't have your electrical contact. Um, and let me just butterfly this out here, Miriam. And I'll split it, just by splitting it open a little bit, it will uh, let her get ones that otherwise wouldn't fit through. It only takes a minute. It saves from losing it in the morselation. Now, since I've got a lot of the strength off, what I'm going to do is now do a horizontal mattress suture. Second. Let me get a little bit of this bleeding here. Where I just took out that little one. Pick up some of that, but I might not be able to get it all. So, okay. And so, in doing this, especially in a woman who wants to, if she wants to have fertility um, or the possibility of it, I like to not have any ex exposed suture. And and I find that to get a good closure of uh, the serosa, the easiest way, because you're getting so tight, is to just run a horizontal mattress suture side to side like this. Um, it is actually very hemostatic. You're often getting a lot of those small vessels there. And I will kind of help the edges come together. And it's going to take the stress off of the serosa. And when it comes to both adhesions, you know, and, you know, for looks, I don't like to have any uh, exposed suture. And so I will actually do a horizontal subserosal stitch to close the serosa. Um, some people, you know, were trained, and as I was initially, to put a so-called baseball stitch over the surface. Um, I just found in fellowship that it, it was not any more effective. You're sticking more needle punctures through the serosa, which is going to cause more bleeding issues. And, uh, and you're leaving exposed suture to, uh, to often create, uh, possibly create more scar tissue and inflammation. And so I started just finishing off with a sub serosal running stitch like uh, you would do on a subcuticular skin stitch. Um, yeah, if you can suction that out there. And what that allows, what that allows me to do is get a very good closure that's very nice and hemostatic. Um, and have no exposed suture at the end, which, um, you know, of course, I have no study to confirm this, but I, uh, you know, I think that by having less exposed suture, you're less apt to having scar tissue formation from uh, an adhesions. This is deep down here in this posterior side, and it's kind of getting a little tough to hold this up and operate. It gets a little floppy. Another stitch.
There are times, though, um, that you have, particularly if you have a uh, very thin covering or if you've got a very small incision, it's very hard to do this subserosal running stitch. And, um, and I will do a through and through, but if I do a through and through, I don't take big bites back here. The serosa really should not have any strength on it. So if I have to do a through and through, I will get just millimeter bites just to reapproximate it. Um, my, I want my stitch underneath to have all the strength on it and to, uh, to have all the force on it. So my serosa is just simply reapproximating in an effort so that it'll heal better. I like to, when I have a vertical like this, start, start at the hardest place to get to. Um, that way it has you finishing out at the front where it's much more obvious. So this is quite, quite posterior here. So I started the, uh, the stitch and I'm just going to dive out near the serosal edge. I will dive under and come out just right at the serosal edge. If I need to, I'll, I can come out just a m half a millimeter or a millimeter outside the serosa. This is a little raggedy down here, so I may do that. Then for most of it, I come out just at the serosal edge, and that way it'll turn itself in very nicely. And not leave any exposed suture. In all honesty, once you kind of get used to it and you can go pretty fast once you get it started and it doesn't take a lot longer at all. Once I get around these corners, you can take a little bit bigger bites and travel more. But I'll come just out at the edge. This is a little raggedy, so it'll, it'll straighten up in just a minute. I even try to do the stitch when I, if on the ones that I occasionally have to do laparoscopically, or if I see a fibroid that I didn't realize was there and take it out laparoscopically, this stitch is much, much more difficult to place with straight sticks than using uh, the articulated hands. So now I'm just, now I'll be able to kind of get going here, getting into the straightaway. So 
Sometimes you can have a little bit of ooze, but almost always by the time you get done morselating, it'll be done. Now, sometimes if I don't want to get under that, I would just grab a half a millimeter there of the serosa. Because that'll tuck in very, very nicely. Got a little bit of a gap here, so... Grab this little ear to hold it down. And really in patients, you know, who are thinking about fertility, you know, that's the, the key, the, the most damaging thing that I can do is, you know, cause a lot of adhesions. And that's one thing about a myomectomy. You know, I've had it, I do a lot of myomectomies when people have prior open myomectomies and they can be very ugly inside. Um, a lot of scar tissue. You know, I've even, I've seen open myomectomies create full bilateral hydrosalpinges that had to be removed. And patients necessitated IVF. Um, and so that's why adhesions can be very detrimental, especially in one of these cases, you know, where it's a posterior incision, the tubes are going to lie over top of this. So I do try to have this be as clean as possible. Now, a lot of times in this situation, actually, by the time, and I'm just going to finish this out right here, by the time the uterus shrinks down, the initial scar tissue formation will be out, will be done. And so um, the tubes may actually be hanging below the uterus while it's healing. So I'll lift that back up. We'll wash it off and show you what it looks like. You can already see the size reduction in her uterus. These adhesions were way down there. Now it's there. Our umbilicus is right here. So the uterus was at about the level of the umbilicus, about right here. Hold on just a second. Let me, let me raise that up for you so we can see posteriorly. And so that's, that's my uterine incision I'm left with there. And uh, that looks pretty nice, I think. I'm very happy with that. Um, when I'm, when I'm totally done at the end, after I morselate, we wash out multiple times. I will put some inner seed over that. It should be done oozing by that time. Now she has a couple other little fibroids I'm going to um, address. I'll take a scissor and tenaculum back. Really all she had, this little tiny one, and then there's one back here that actually, the small one, but it's four centimeters. So now if I come up here and look around, um, I think it's right there if I look at the MRI. This is where I'm using my sixth sense. You know, I don't have haptic feedback. But I, I'm using the elbow, the, the corner of this wrist, and I'm watching the tissue give. Uh, you know, and you can see it, it's kind of popping over something right there. And I know that's the vicinity from the MRI. It's just under the surface. Now, uh, what I will do, um, Miriam, go ahead and put the 30 degree down scope in for me. Okay, so now uh, we've put in the 30 degree down scope. 
and and this will really, especially in these big cases like this, I have to really get over this top. You can really see the benefit of this. Does that feel like that's part of it too, Miriam? And my assistant's kind of feeling that, yeah. Look at that. that might be the body of it, and this is just the end of it. So I have to think my round ligament is here. I'm going to have uterine arteries running right under there. So um, I'm going to be very careful of that. Let me just relax this a little bit. I'm going to make an incision away from myself. I'm going to try to get a little more hemostatic here because if I get into some major bleeding, um, I might have trouble reaching it with my arms. When things are so distorted, uh, it can be difficult to locate even <laughs> semi-large fibroids. I think this is the same deal here. This is probably a very, very soft fibroid. It, um, I think that's what we're dealing with again, of course. Yep. There we go. There's the proper plane. Working in an area like this, you do have to be very careful because when this pops out, if it's bleeding a lot in the bottom, it'll retract down and you're really down, you can easily be down in the, in the side of the uterus almost um, you can actually take a lot of fibroids out. I often, that'll go from this side to the posterior side. And if you have bleeding, it's now inverted and you can never get back over there. So usually I will watch this fibroid very carefully as I'm bringing it out and try to make sure that I have my area marked or I have hold of my tissue and then start sewing it real quick before it totally retracts down. Of course, this is her little fibroid, but you can see that how well it hides. You know, this is not a tiny one. Might have to extend it just a shade, but actually, it doesn't really feel like extending it will help. back here a little bit because I don't want those to rip and leave me with a lot of bleeding that I can't get to. That would be
This has a consistency very similar to the others. It's just very, very difficult to work out. It doesn't want to pop out easily like many fibroids do. might help or hinder me to, to piece this out. We'll see. Sometimes that will give me more room to rotate it and spin it and therefore nucleate the back side. So when it does, all you can really do is just work yourself around from one side to the other. Gain on it just a little bit here and there. And it will eventually come. It has to. This is also uh, more difficult to get out because since I've decompressed the uterus, um, the uterus elsewhere is is much more is much floppier, and so it's difficult to have any any counter traction to pull against. So you just have to slowly work it out. And this was about four and a half centimeters on on the MRI. I don't know if you can. <laughs> Actually, maybe if you can, I don't know if you might be able to help me, Mary. If you can grab, can you maybe grab it and push it away from me? Yeah. Let's see. Usually I don't have my assistant help much in the case. Um, she might be able to get, because I almost need it. See if you can lift it up in this way towards the bladder. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's just not, it's just not wanting to budge, is it? So I might have to do like I did before and just maybe piece it off again. Okay, let me see what I can do with it now.
Okay, it's a lot of smoke doing this. When you're making a lot of smoke like this, your assistant is really key that she's able to evacuate the smoke but not take too much that I lose my pneumo. Is a little, a little deceptive. Definitely bigger than you, you know, my initial thought. Initial thought would just grab it, pop it out, but often they can be difficult because they may have other lips down here that will kind of get caught. One problem with this is, of course, getting the fibroids are out are the easy part, and this hole is going to retract. I have to be very careful not to let it do that before I can get some stitches in and get started closing it. Do like I did before. Just Yeah, here I'm behind it, so this is where I'm cutting back on it to try not to tear away from it. That's always an option when you have a fibroid you can't get around is just to cut it off, piece it out, and then that, that lets you just get different planes. You get different angles at it. Um, you can pull it differently and uh, roll it differently and make headway. Yeah, this is definitely a good size fibroid. No need MRI, it did, you know, look four or five centimeters, but just in comparison it paled to the other large one.
Now, um, go ahead and put the, uh, the needle driver in and give me a stitch. So what I'm going to do before I pull this out, as soon as I pull this out, it's going to retract in. I'm going to put a needle in and get a, a bite of that base tissue. Otherwise, it can retract. Now, I don't have a lot of bleeding, but if, if I did have a lot of bleeding, it would be even more critical. Okay. So now, before I pull this out, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is get a bite of this bottom tissue here. Might even get my needle started here. Before I pull this all the way out. Now I can get this base that was bleeding before losing it. Because when you lose this down in there at this angle, as far as I am in, to almost the limits of my arms, um, I would have a lot, I would have to just throw blind stitches down in there to get that closed and uh, get the bleeding stopped. Now, uh, just to demonstrate, like I mentioned, if I did want to do a, a, a running stitch to close this, all I would do is, and of course up here you can see where she's had these prior adhesions, a little bit of suture will not be the worst, the biggest part of her problem in adhesion formation up here. So what I will do though is just take very little bites um, of the serosa. Again, this is going to shrink down, contract down really well, and and so that way, if I do leave exposed suture, and there are some times when you just really can't get it closed without having some exposed suture, but what I will do is just Taking very, very tiny bites, they're more than enough. You don't need wide one centimeter bites. There's no strength here as this contracts down. Um, these stitches are gonna be loose in a couple days anyway. Um, and so these, these are just a temporizing measure.
Now, if you can give me the scissor back, and we'll take out this one little one here, and then I believe that is everything. Sometimes if I'm running, I have multiple small ones like this. I'll just dive under and come out the next one and dive under again. I can do that, but what I'm going to do with this is reuse this one. I could either tie an overhand knot in the end of this and use it, but often if you just bury it, and, I'm, and I've, in order to get this hemostatic, I am going to have to go through and through. I'll just simply bury it and hold on to it. By the time I uh, loop it back and forth on top of itself a couple times, it will hold very, very well. That's how I handle the small ones. So there we are from start to finish. The uterus is very boggy, uh, very baggy, but it will contract down well. And you can see our final incision there is now pretty hemostatic. There's probably definitely some ooze because this is so big, so some of it's going to ooze out, and that's not necessarily incisional ooze. And, um, and so I'm typically not worried about that. After, um, after I'm done with this, I will, I will place interseed over this, um, though I do like it to be hemostatic um, and actually what I will maybe do in this situation is maybe just protect the ovary and two more from this than this from that so maybe instead of lying it over here I'll maybe just mainly lie it over uh, around the tube and ovary since that's my biggest concern um, I usually like to use some kind of barrier if I have a lot of incisions or ones that are bleeding I'll sometimes use adept um, I, you know, I wish we had a better a barrier that wouldn't cause fibrosis than uh, interseed, but right now that's the best we had to work with. I'm also going to lay an, a sheet of interseed across the top of this to try to prevent this from sticking back up here as well. So now I'm going to undock and we will morselate. 